Hello and welcome to Eco Magazine's takeover of the Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Haley, and in the first part of this deep dive series, I'm joined by Dr. Nathan Briggs to discuss the important role the Argo Network plays in observing our ocean. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead and just give us a brief intro on who you are and what you do here at the National Oceanography Center? Yes. Uh, my name is Nathan Briggs, and I'm a researcher here at the National Oceanography Center. My work focuses on the sort of broad field of biogeochemistry. So that's the ocean biology and ocean chemistry and how they sort of interact on a big scale. Um, I focus primarily on using autonomous robotic technologies to look at biological carbon uptake in the oceans. Okay. As far as the Argo program is concerned, how are you involved with that? Sure. So the Argo program is a, a program of autonomous robotic floating platforms in the ocean that measure uh, a variety of um, important physical and chemical and biological properties in the, in the ocean. I first became involved in the Argo program in 2014 when I joined a team in France who was working on pioneering the use of new biological sensors on, on this platform. Um, and then since then, um, I moved to NOC and became more intimately involved in not just using the data from these floats, but um, deploying our own floats that, that NOC has purchased. Um, and so far, we've deployed uh, 10 of these floats. And we are, my, my role at the NOC is coordinating the deployment, setting the parameters for these floats, deciding um, how frequently they measure different um, measurements, biological and chemical measurements, and also coordinating with other countries who are deploying similar floats to make sure that we're uh, achieving a broad coverage of the ocean that integrates well. That's really awesome. As far as the different biological sensors that are on there, you mentioned some new ones on the platforms and floats. What are they and what do they measure? Sure. So so traditionally, um, Argo floats have, have been around for um, two, two decades now and measuring primarily physical parameters. This is the ocean temperature. This is a critical, obviously critical um, part of the ocean, how it works is the temperature, also the salt content of the ocean, which determines mm -hmm. Um, helps determine how dense water is and therefore what the currents do. Um, but more recently, as you mentioned, um, scientists have been putting biological and chemical sensors on these floats. Um, and there are now uh, six established biological and chemical parameters or types of measurements that we're making from these floats at, uh, and intending to do at a global scale. And these include um, light, so this is critical for ocean life and photosynthesis is how far into the ocean light gets. Uh, this includes chlorophyll, so the pigment that makes plants green also makes a lot of algae green. That's what uh, allows photosynthesis to happen. Um, we also measured just total particle concentration in the ocean. Um, and that's important because most of the, the uh, sort of the base of the biological food chain in the ocean is tiny plankton. So these are tiny particles, some of them living, some of them dead, that make up most of the, of the biomass of the ocean. Um, the other things we measure are um, an important nutrient called nitrate. Um, and this is, in many parts of the ocean, this is the sort of limiting nutrient, so the most important nutrient for allowing algae to grow, which, is, which then allows everything else to grow on top of that. Um, we also measure oxygen. Um, th this is useful, you know, both because much of ocean life requires oxygen, but also because the oxygen produced by uh, algae gives us a way to look at how how productive our oceans are. Um, and then another important one is ocean pH. So um, many of us are aware that with the rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide a lot of that carbon dioxide is actually going into the ocean and when it does that means less ocean less uh, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere but on the other hand that means uh, the carbon dioxide 
actually undergoes a chemical reaction in ocean water and makes it a bit more uh, acidic. So measuring ocean pH is another critical um, critical measurement that we need to make in our oceans. Gotcha. Very cool. Thank you for giving me those details. Now, you said that your main background and interest is in ocean carbon. Does the mm -hmm. Argo program have any like specific measurements for carbon? And yeah, so, so there's, there's a, a number of ways the Argo program helps measure the ocean's ability to, to take up carbon and also what it does with that carbon, what the ocean does with that carbon once it's been uh, taken into the ocean. And one of these is pH because as the carbon dioxide is taken up, it does change ocean pH. So we can help, but tracking ocean pH helps us to, to quantify how much carbon is being taken up by the oceans. Um, and that's the sort of physical diffusion or the, of carbon dioxide into the ocean causes that um, change in pH. There's also biological uptake. So just like on, on land, plants take up carbon dioxide and you know they may be stored for hundreds of years in trees for example um, in the ocean we have plankton uh, specifically algae or phytoplankton taking up carbon dioxide um, and that's what my re research focuses on what happens to that carbon that is taken up by ocean life and one of the ways that these float measurements help us understand that is um, by, for example, measuring oxygen throughout a day. Because what we know is when um, algae, just like plants, when they take up carbon dioxide, they also release oxygen. And what we've seen from these floats is we, we can take measurements of oxygen at different times of day, and we can see how, how much extra oxygen we get at the end of a day, and then how much the oxygen then declines overnight. And by looking at the difference between oxygen at the end of the day and the end of the night, we can infer how much carbon is being taken up by photosynthesis, by these uh, ocean algae um, in, the, in the surface ocean each day. And then we can go further and we can distinguish how much carbon is being taken up each day and then released each night. And then we can look at the, the carbon that's not being released each night and what happens to that. And the way we track that is by looking at, you know, I said before that we these uh, floats make particle measurements. Mm -hmm. um, we can look for particles appearing at different depths in the ocean. And that's where um, one of the big benefits of these floats are is that they dive every 10 days to two kilometers of depth. So they can see beneath the surface ocean which is generally quite difficult to monitor. Um, so a lot of my research focuses on these particle measurements and observing how many of the particles that are produced at the surface when these um, algae grow and divide, how many of those particles end up sinking and to what depth do they sink. And that determines how deep the carbon that they contain gets. And that carbon is really important for two, two reasons. One, that carbon ends up being the food for different ocean organisms that live at these different depths. And the other reason is the deeper the carbon gets, the longer that carbon gets stored in the ocean interior. And the longer until that carbon interacts with the atmosphere again. And that means the less, the deeper the, that carbon gets, the less carbon dioxide ends up in our atmosphere. Gotcha. That's super interesting. You mentioned that the Argo floats can move up and down. Are they, so they're not stationary. Do they move in different locations also? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, so these Argo floats um, have a small pump in them that they can use to regulate their buoyancy. This is a battery powered pump. So the, and that's the, the only really thing they can do is they can float or they can sink. <laughs> um, Everything else, they get kind of swept with the currents. Okay. Um, so they are sort of robotic and they can move, but they can't, they can't choose where they get to go. Um, so generally, the way these floats um, move through the water 
they start at the surface where they're originally deployed. Um, they can communicate by satellite and send any data they have, take any new commands, and then they dive down to about a kilometer's depth and then drift for 10 days in basically sleep mode where they're consuming very little energy. Okay. And then every 10 days, they then dive further down to two kilometers depth and then all the way up to the surface, making measurements all the way. So you get measurements every few meters from, from two kilometers depth all the way to the surface. And it takes a few hours for, for, for the float to do that. Um, and it takes very little energy too, because you only have to pump once to change your buoyancy or, or perhaps a few times along the profile. And then that's all the energy you need to expend. And then you just let the float float up to the, the top of the water. Then you can, um, the float sends its data, all the measurements is taken along the way, sends all that information by satellite back to our data assembly centers, um, which are all over the world. Um, and then the float comes back down. And so most of the motion of the float has to do with um, what the currents are doing at a thousand meters. So we can't control where they go, but when each time they surface, we, we look at where they surface last, we look at where they surface next, and then we can infer what the currents must have been doing at a thousand meters. So even though they're measuring other parameters, not currents directly, we get some interesting information about ocean currents from that uh, motion as well. It sounds like a really large ocean observing effort. Do you know off the top of your head how many floats are out there right now? Uh, good question. So in, in the total Argo network, I think the, the original target was about 3,000 floats. I think right now there's over 3,800. So, oh, so wow. we, we passed that original target, nearly 4,000 floats. Um, and they're profiling every 10 days or so. Um, so it's really a quite remarkable achievement. And it's only really made possible by a heavy international coordination. So I think there are 30 different countries who have been participating in this. Out of those almost 4,000 floats, about 500 of them have at least one biological chemical um, sensor on them. And only at this point, I think just under 40 of them have all six of the biological and chemical um, measurements that I was talking to you about earlier. Um, and of those, of those 38, I think uh, the NOC has deployed now 10 of those. Okay. As far as like advantages of the robots um, and they move up and down by themselves, what are some of the advantages as compared to some other ocean observing methods? Sure. I mean, we have lots of ways to look at the ocean. Uh, traditionally, um, we go out in ships and collect water <laughs> or drag nets through the water um, and collect what the nets pull up and look at you know a certain place, a certain time. Um, that those observing capabilities really expanded with things like satellite observations that can really look at the whole ocean. But we can only look at a few, you know, a, a few of the things we're interested in from satellite, and we can only usually look at the very surface of the ocean. So the big advantage of this Argo program is it allows us to be in every major ocean and every season, and not just the surface, but um, through, through depth and make some of these chemical observations that are not possible by satellites. The, sat the satellites do a clever trick by looking at the color of the ocean. They can tell something about the algae in the ocean and maybe, maybe how many particles, but we can't see um, ocean oxygen from satellite. We can't see um, the nutrients in the ocean. Um, so, so there's big pieces that we've been missing throughout most of the ocean, um, and especially below the surface. And this has a whole range of benefits to be able to see under the ocean surface, um, basically at all times of year. Um, one of them is you know, we, we get to understand what's going on under the ice. Um, so for example, a, a recent discovery was made using these floats that you know, actually um, under relatively compact sea ice, 
we, we see phytoplankton growing, algae growing, um, much earlier than we would have expected. So we, we didn't think there was enough light there for them to grow. And what we're seeing once we actually put these floats under there, observing where we weren't able to observe before, um, we're able to see growth of algae. Um, another thing we've been able to see that we wouldn't have seen without these robotic platforms out here is, I don't know if you remember in 2019, 2020, there was a big uh, wildfire in uh, a series of wildfires in Australia. And there was a huge plume of smoke that was going out over the ocean. And what some scientists observed was um, we were lucky that there were these floats were already out there in the area because the, the ambition is to, to have coverage you know, all over the ocean. Um, so when any particular event happens that might affect the ocean, we have something there mm -hmm. to measure what's happening. We have something that was already there to, to measure how things were before this event happened. Um, and so we were able to see uh, that there was a fairly rapid response in the algae because the, the smoke from these wildfires contained iron, which was an important nutrient for the algae to grow. So this increased the ocean productivity. And we were able to confirm that because we had these floats here. And if you have enough, you always have measurements in the right place at the right time to understand the effects of different processes that you might not have planned to measure in the ocean. Gotcha. So as far as like some of the advancements, what are some of the things you're like most excited about or some of the questions you're most excited about? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So what I'm really excited about is, is being able to tackle global questions and global challenges. Um, there was a paper very recently that I, I alluded to before that um, measured sort of for the first time the global production of the ocean, the global uh, photosynthesis of the ocean. And that was by taking lots of oxygen measurements over the whole ocean in all seasons. Um, and what I'm really excited about is sort of for the first time ever, we have the capacity to track changes in global ocean biology, both at the surface and under the surface. And we know that there, you know, as humans, we're starting to have big scale global impacts on sort of all of our ecosystems around the world, but including ocean ecosystems. And our traditional ways of detecting these impacts um, have left big gaps. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite excited about that aspect that, you know, we, when we see at a certain marine station in a certain part of the ocean, we see there's less nutrients here than there used to be. Well, have those nutrients just moved, you know, a, a few kilometers up the coast to uh, another place that we're not measuring? Or is this you know, a, a fundamental change in the ocean you know, nutrient circulation that, that is going to have broad scale impacts? Well, if we're measuring basically the global ocean and we're measuring it all the seasons, then we get to track the, the entire inventory of important nutrients rather than just looking at certain local impacts. So I would say I'm most excited to look at sort of really global, big scale trends in what's happening to our ocean. Gotcha. So outside of you said you kind of coordinate a lot of the effort. What are some of the other jobs or things that people do with the Argo program? Yeah, so so there's a lot of people involved in doing a lot of things. Um, in fact, um, one of the other researchers here at the NOC, Brian King, um, has just recently become co-chair of the Argo steering team. And this is the sort of umbrella organization that coordinates at a global level the entire Argo network. Um, so there's an international so coordinating or steering body. There's also uh, an international data management team. So you have people making, uh, you know, or groups of uh, international groups of people making decisions about, you know, what are the science ob objectives, what are the technology objectives, 
we have people developing the technology. So these a lot of private companies are developing the, the floats and the sensors that are used. And there's a lot of activity going on right now in, in, in developing new lower cost, lower power sensors, making the floats last longer. Um, then there's um, the NOC is the host of the British Oceanographic Data Center that um, hosts, that brings in all the data from all the UK floats and then feeds them into this, these global data assembly centers. And there's two of them, one in France and one in the US that collate all the data from all these floats. So there's another huge sort of piece of Argo, which is the data management. And then there are all the scientists, including myself, that then use those data to, to tackle different research questions. Gotcha, super cool. Outside of, we've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Is there anything else specific that you really want to share about Argo or maybe a funny story or any, anything in general? <laughs> yeah, good question. So, so I'm, I'm just excited overall. I think Argo is changing the way we do science. Um, traditionally, it was so hard to get just a few measurements. So most of the effort and exploration in oceanography has been um, you have to you think of a question, you propose an expedition to a part of the ocean, and then go explore. You put something in the water, take something out, and then often you're surprised with what you find. Um, now, with Argo, we're able to take in so ingest so much data, save this data, um, and then there becomes a new sort of journey of exploration, which is anybody, these data are freely available all over the world, anybody in the world can then have, think of their own question and then take their own journey of exploration through these existing data. So you can go anywhere in the ocean now at any depth and any of a number of different measurements that you're interested in. And then you can think of a question like, how are these wildfires impacting the plankton, the algae in this area? And then you can go explore that. And I really enjoyed uh, in my own work, sort of asking questions, exploring the data. And I've been able to find some interesting results. Of, for example, um, as I've talked about, I study the, the sinking carbon in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, people have been wondering why sinking um, carbon, we see how fast it's sinking. We see how fast it's being broken down, and we would think you know, it should be getting quite a bit deeper and storing more carbon. And there have been various hypotheses to why a lot of that carbon stays pretty shallow. And what I was able to do is look through um, some of the data in these from these floats and observe that we were seeing large, fast sinking particles that were bringing this carbon deep. Um, and as soon as you start seeing these as soon as they start to disappear, at those depths, you start to see lots of small, smaller particles appear. And so this helped to confirm one hypothesis that people had been um, studying for a while was maybe these fast sinking particles are breaking up and then they stop sinking. Um, and so we had been studying you know, how fast the particles were consumed, how fast they were sinking, and what we couldn't confirm is whether they were breaking up because this is something happening half a kilometer depth this is a particle that's a millimeter across breaking into a few particles that are tenths or hundredths of millimeters. And so that event is not something that's very easy to observe. But by having these floats out there, taking lots of measurements all the time, when you come up with a question like that, the existing data that they, they have can then help you reason about what processes are happening. And now we have a better understanding of how and why partic particles that are sinking, store or don't store carbon in the ocean. Gotcha. Very cool. Thank you for joining me today, Nathan. To find out more about the Argo Network, follow the link in the description where you can access the latest edition of Eco Magazine. And make sure to subscribe to Into the Blue on your favorite podcast app to ensure you don't miss out on part two coming in July 2023. See you soon.